Assembly, before we start, I want to inform everybody that you're, you're going to be able to ask questions at the end of the presentation. We're now transmitting, I think, on a YouTube link, but in the Zoom link, you have a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A in the Zoom to ask questions. And for those of you who are present here, you can ask questions here at the end of the presentation. Also, you, also for those of you that are here, we have simultaneous translation. If you need it, there's headphones at the entrance. So this will be our agenda for tonight. We're gonna to have opening and key messages from the board. Dr. Menard is gonna present the organizational health, academics, and the status of our strategic plan. Then we're gonna have updates from the governance and human resource committees. We have Ernst and Young present here today that are gonna present our audited financial statements then we're gonna have a finance report from the head of our finance committee, and then we're gonna to move to the questions and answers. So before we start our presentation, I want you to get to know the board and have everybody here present themselves. My name is Mariela Paredes, I am the board chair. I have two kids at ISP, one is in pre-kinder and the other is in third grade. I am Panamanian, this is my fourth year on the board, my first year as board chair, and I am also a proud ISP alum. We have Carlos Giraldo who is on the way. He's been on the board for four years. He used to be our board chair. He's now our board vice president and he has two kids at ISP, both of them in middle school. Well, uh, we have Rafael Quinn who's the treasurer of the board. He's also the head of the finance committee. He has one kid at ISP, Bradley, who is in second grade. <laughs> we have Eduardo Caruso, who's the head of the HR committee. He has one kid at ISP and one student to enroll in pre-kinder. His 
oldest kid is in first grade. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Yasser Williams is in here today. Uh, he's on his third year on the board. He has two kids at ISP, Amir in fourth grade and Sarah in third grade. Chris Burgos has four kids at ISP. They're in high school, middle school, and elementary. He has kids in every division. <laughs> Patrick Kelly has kids in high school. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three kids at ISP. Gretel Chiniglo is also here. She's one of our newest board members. She has three kids at ISP, also in high school, middle school, and elementary school. And Heather Watson is our newest member, and she has two girls at ISP in middle school. In middle school. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the board members that were with us during the school year 2021 who are no longer part of the board. They dedicated a lot of their time to the board. Alexis Tata and Wison Uzcategui, we want to thank them for their service. Okay, so to start out our board presentation, I thought it important that I recap a little bit on how the board works, how the board is, the board composition, and what we do, and the committees we have at the board. We have nine members in the board, as you just saw in the presentation. Of those nine board members, five are elected by the association, which is you, and four are appointed by the board of directors. We all have different backgrounds, come from different nationalities, and bring different strengths to the table. We have two standing, two official standing committees of the past year, which was the Finance Committee, headed by Rafa Quinn, and the Governance Committee, headed by Chris Burgost. And we had two ad hoc committees, which were the Construction Committee, headed by Patrick Kelly, and the HR Committee, headed by Eduardo Caruso. We will have, this coming year, an audit committee. So, as you know, ISP is a non-for-profit school, and ISP does not have an owner. That means that the maximum authority in ISP is the General Assembly. The General Assembly chooses a board of directors to have oversight on the school. And basically, as a board, we have, we can say, three main roles or responsibilities. And the first one is to set the strategic plan and vision to ensure ISP's long-term viability. The second is to oversee the finances and other legal responsibilities at the, of the school. And the third is to hire, support, and oversee the head of school. We meet basically once a month officially as a board, but we have other meetings as committees, committee meetings, and other meetings every, anytime it's necessary. So for the priorities and key messages for this year, first of all, we want to thank everyone. We want to thank you for your support. School year 2021 continued to be a unique and challenging year. We were in the middle of COVID. We spent most of our school year online. Our main focus was on reopening the school and lobbying with government officials to bring kids back to campus. We were also strongly focused on making the necessary biosecurity investments and setting the biosecurity protocols needed to have our kids and staff back on campus safely. We want to thank you, the parents, for supporting us and trusting us and keeping your kids at ISP. We also want to thank all those new families that trusted us in the middle of a world pandemic and enrolled their kids at ISP during the 2021 school year. We had 111 new families enrolling their kids in the middle of the pandemic. We also want to thank institutions that always support us. We gave rebates this year, but we have institutions that opted out of those rebates for the 2021. We had the U.S. Embassy opting out, Procter & Gamble, and Nestle. We also had support from the U.S. Embassy in the form of grants. They gave us a grant for investments in biosecurity, biosecurity equipment, and we also had a grant from the U.S. Embassy for security having to do with CCTV cameras. We want to thank our faculty and staff. They were committed to getting our kids back on campus, but they were also committed to the online learning. They did a lot of sacrifices and personal efforts to try to le relearn how to teach, teaching online. Nobody was ready for that, but you know, they were the rock stars, they di did it, they were there for our kids. We also have a staff that's 100% committed to biosecurity protocols, 
and we're glad to say that 97% of our staff is vaccinated today. And in the end, we want to thank our students. You know, they were always ready to learn. They were the most resilient. You know, they, 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 they were ready to learn online. They were ready to learn in person. And once we got those kids back on campus, they are the real masters following biosecurity protocols, keeping their masks on, you know, keeping their distance, washing their hands. Without the kids, it wouldn't have been the same. They were so happy to be back on campus once we got them back. So this AGA is about the 2021 school year. So during the 2021 school year, as I said, our main priority was academic excellence. But what did academic excellence look, for, look like for 2021? For us, it meant we needed to get kids back on campus. So our main focus during 2021 was how to get the kids back on campus, how do we reopen the school, and how do we get back to normal? As you know, we were the first school in Panama to have kids back on campus in March 2019, just like we were the first school in Panama to have our kids go online when the pandemic started. Other than COVID and focusing how to get kids back, we were focused on continued governance improvements within the board, governance improvements for our school. You will hear a bit when the governance committee presents. We were focused on keeping the finances in control. You will hear from finance as well. We're always working, constantly working on communication, how we communicate internally as a school and how we communicate externally with the parents. And we were very focused on working cohesively as a board. We're nine board members with different personalities, backgrounds, and working in the middle of a pandemic, you know, through Zoom, we really focused on trying to work cohesively and maintain a united board. And another important focus for us was that when we brought students back, we wanted to maintain student and staff health. We have a great and efficient COVID traceability program. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to our school nurse. Without her, it wouldn't have been possible. She's great at COVID traceability, at you know keeping everyone in check, that everybody's following um, the protocols. And I am happy to say that since we got students back on campus on March 2019, to this date, we have only closed nine classrooms and we have zero confirmed cases of on-campus transmission. So with that, I leave you with our key messages. Our key messages is that we continue to lead the way in Panama as a school. We were the first to go online. We were the first to bring kids back. We were instrumental in the lobbying and negotiations done with the government to reduce the social distancing space needed to bring more kids back on campus. We've worked hard. We worked hard the whole year, continued contact with the government, uh, seeing how we can bring the kids back and what we needed to do for, for that to occur safely. We have our finances in control. Current enrollment at the school is doing great. We have above 90% enrollment. We have some grades that are at 100% capacity. Um, we also did key investments during the 2021 school year, which you will hear more about, but those were the cafeteria, an elementary STEM lab, and an iPad rollout. Dr. Menard's gonna mention more in detail some of these. There was no increase in tuition during the 2021 school year, and we gave back in rebates $1.3 million to our families. Another important thing that, we, that happened in 2021 is that we kicked off our strategic planning. As you know, ISP had a five-year strategic plan which came to an end in 2019. We were supposed to roll out, roll a new plan out in 2021, but in the middle of COVID, it was a bit difficult. But we were able to kick the plan off. And what we did is we hired an international consultant, which was Mark Olfers, which has worked previously with the school. He worked with us for the, our last head of school search. And so he's worked with the board before and he's a great consultant. We hired him to kick off the plan. We were also able to do a, to survey our parents. We surveyed the community about what was important for the community to include in that plan. And we established a committee uh, composed of 20 people that are parents, 
board members, alum, staff, students, different nationalities, different genders. And we've been working over 28 hours. We've met as a group. And then there, there's been several sub-meetings of smaller groups. So we've been able to kick off that strategic plan. And Dr. Menard is gonna update you a bit more about the status of that plan. So this was 2021. And then looking forward, these are our goals looking forward. As I mentioned, the strategic plan. Our number one priority looking forward is to approve and launch this new plan I've been talking about. Another goal for this year was to complete the cafeteria remodel on budget, and that was done. We, wanted to, we want to continue to do an invest, investments in energy efficiency for the school. We're looking forward to approve investments to improve and enhance our science labs. We're going to establish an audit committee as a permanent committee of the board. We want to finalize our policy manual and board handbook. We want to expand alumni engagement programs. And of course, we want to continue to do all of this, keeping our finances in control. So with that, I leave you with Dr. Menard, who's going to talk a little bit about the organizational health of the school, academics, and strategic planning. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here to come to our AGA this year. We really appreciate it. It's great to have actually people in the audience in addition to the live streaming. So thanks for coming all the way out here on a rainy day. I really want to thank, first I'll just say parents in general, for all that you're doing to um, collaborate with us to make sure your kids are getting the best education possible. It's really been great having open communications with you. I do have an open door policy and I have really treasured the many meetings that I've had with parents in the last year and a half. Um, I do want to re-emphasize that if anybody does want to meet with me and are worried about language, you can speak Spanish and I, I will follow along but have a translator with me as well so you can speak with me um, in your native tongue. So I just want you to know you're welcome to my office. Um, teachers, the teachers in the last year and even this year, if you read everywhere, there's articles, teachers are exhausted, teachers are tired, and yet they're just hanging in there supporting these kids. And I just wanna thank the teachers for hanging in there and doing the hard work to make sure our kids are getting the education that they need. I wanna thank um, the students. Oh, they're just the highlight of everything that we do. They come to school so resiliently every day. They're beaming, they're loving school. And they're really what keep us all going and getting out of bed in the morning. And finally, I do want to thank the board. Um, these are volunteer board members. And they all have very big lives and work all the time. And the amount of time they dedicate and give to the school is admirable. And I'm really enjoying working with them. So I just want to thank them, too, for all of their hard work. So um, I just want to take a moment and think about where we started, because again, this is about last year. So a year ago, I remember flying in here to Panama on a humanitarian flight, thanks to our Afro attorneys in the US Embassy, they were able to get me in here. I was locked into a house I've never been in before in my life, and I couldn't leave for at least two weeks because of quarantine, and then I, couldn't, I wasn't allowed to go to school because we could only leave the house for two hours a day, men two days a week, women three days a week, and. That was a crazy time. That was only a year ago that we were living that lifestyle. Um, you know, remember when you had your kids at home and you were trying to work and trying to get them to learn online? Like that was crazy. It's hard, it feels like years ago. Uh, but that was only a year ago that this happened. And um, the school had successfully figured out how to end school one day and go online the next day. Like the school really did a lot to get ready, but we didn't know how long this would end. So I walk into the picture and we don't know what the future is. So I came in and this is what we did. Well, I, first I had the not fun job of looking at the budget, looking at enrollment and realizing one of the first things I had to do was cut budget, cut some more staffing. 
And that was not a fun thing to do, but it allowed us to make budget and take care of parents that needed the rebates because finances were really tough last year. Um, we, we then looked at all the best practices that were happening around the world. Um, teachers everywhere, I mean, I'm sorry, heads of school everywhere, we were all chatting with each other, saying what's working, what's not working, because we were all together trying to figure out this immediate shift from the classroom to fully online learning. And so at ISP, we re-envisioned the work that we had done the previous year, spoke with you, we did surveys with all of you, and we tweaked, and we talked to the students too and got their feedback, and we tweaked our program to be blended learning. And blended learning, which had been around for a good 10 years, really wasn't as well known as it is now. Now it's a, a major part of what we do. Um, but that was a crazy time. Um, I will say all of us upgraded our technological abilities between um, new programs, um, learning um, how to use different platforms. I mean, for all the teachers and the administrators, it was a great learning curve. The kids, they were resilient. They bounced right along. Um, we really focused on safety for our employees and our students and staff. We spent oodles of money on equipment to ensure biosecurity safety and procedures. Oh my gosh, the procedures. Imagine three-year-old reading books and after that we have to decontaminate them and have them sit for two weeks before they can be touched again. I mean, the level of detail we had to come up with was crazy, but we did a good job because Maduka started sending all the directors of schools to us for tours on a regular basis so they could see how to do biosecurity protocols well. We found ways to get kids back onto campus. It was, it was a little odd, but we picked the in-person support program because they wouldn't let us bring kids back to school, but we could do tutoring, so that was our version. And we did get them back on campus, albeit two days a week for a half a day. We were so happy to welcome them back to school. And remember, Panama is one of the countries in the US, I mean, in the world, that's been online the longest. I mean, all these other countries were, were opening and we, and we just couldn't do anything. So it was, it was great to at least get them in half time. Um, by the end of the year, we got them in for a full day, but it was still the every other day thing. I would say, while we, we didn't navigate the pandemic perfectly, we did do a good job, I think. And it's only because all of us came together and worked together to make us get through this very difficult situation. But before we get too comfortable, our nurse did ask me to make sure I said tonight that we're not out of the woods yet. Countries all around us have gone back to closing schools. Thank God Panama has not, but it could happen. So we still have to remember to be vigilant, follow our biosecurity protocols and codes. If you have a sick kid, keep them at home. Um, you know, wear masks and all those things. Get vaccinated. That, that's really, I think, the best way we can take care of each other. Um, so we, looking back at things like academic excellence. So amazingly, our IB students did better than they've ever done in years at ISP. We had the highest scores we've had in a long time. We, had, we could very comfortably beat the world average. And we had a student score, a perfect score on the IB exam. Amazing. <laughs> Now, now, while our MAP scores that we did were not as high as they usually are, um, when we did the MAP testing just very recently, because the kids have been back in school, we've seen huge jumps. So we feel like that just really goes to show, especially with the younger ones, that in-person social learning is just so much better than just being online, online, online. So we're happy to see the MAP scores jumping ahead again. Um, our kids um, are also just involved in everything. We did have sports last year. I don't know of any other school that was able to do sports when we came back. And some ASAs now, oh my gosh, every sport is going. Second semester, we've got international trips going back with Misa, or no, ASA, ASCA, that's what it is. And then we have all kinds of ASAs, kids clubs are on fire. 
um, the musical we just had that was amazing. And then we're just about, we're students, we have about 100 students trying out right now for our musical in the spring, which will be The Little Mermaid. The school is alive and our kids are just back to life fully. So it's, it's a very exciting time. Now, while last year, where, where we, we weren't on campus with the same demands that we are now with all the activities like, so that did give us a little more time to be strategic. So with that extra time when students weren't on campus, we were able to do some work around, um, uh, some work around facilities and we were able to do some work around strategy. Um, so we, we've already mentioned to you some of the things that we've spent money on. Um, not mentioned was our admissions area remodel, where we have the whole front office and, and front entrance has been refreshed. So as we welcome new families into our school. And we were also able to add a lot of PK outdoor classrooms. Um, and, and it was in the plan down the road, but it just worked out to do it now because of COVID. On the strategy side, um, we didn't. We had an, a, a rolling admissions program before. Now we've reworked everything to have strategic enrollment management. We have a new team that is killing it in there. Um, we've done a lot of research, market um, s surveys. We have interviewed lots of people with the help of uh, with the help of a company, and I, we really know our landscape now, and we really know how to promote ISP and how, how we can welcome families in a, in a better way than we did before. And as a result, grades six through 12 are basically full and we've got some seats in the elementary school, um, but we're, we're, we're doing really well with enrollment. We created a definition of learning for ISP. We did a student support audit. And basically what that means is, if you think of what, what do you do when students aren't learning? So and this applies for all children. So if they're not learning, the first tier is what do we do? And that usually involves a teacher, some maybe one-on-one -on -one work, some small group work, but what do we do? And if that doesn't work, the next tier, tier two is, okay, what's more intensive? What do we need to do to help them more? And if that doesn't work, the third tier is the most intensive support. Well, we really didn't have anything in place that was systematic there. So that's something that we audited. We know what we have, we know what we didn't have, and that's been able to inform our strategic planning so we can systematically help our kids so no child falls through the cracks and they get the additional support they need um, if they need it. We totally reworked our ed tech strategy. We had an old vision. Um, where we've moved to an Apple organization and we are using technology, not for technology's sake, but to create, to research, and to augment learning. It's not a tool or an app just for its sake. And then finally, I'll talk more about in a minute, we were able to jump into strategic planning. That is a lot of work <laughs> that we were able to do, but we, we were able to do it because we had um, uh, some time when the kids weren't there. And so we used it well. Our STEM lab and our STEM work, I just wanted to get, show you some pictures. These kids are loving the STEM lab. They are just on fire. Every time I go by there, I pop in and to see what they're doing and there's so many activities. I've seen art where like these little kids are programming balls, robotic balls to run through paint to make pictures. I've seen, you know, like the little girl in the corner, she's programming a, a robot to go around this track. So they're doing programming at a very young age. We've got kids producing, um, you know, the, the news for the school. Um, it, we're doing, we've purchased a, an engineering curriculum where all elementary students, PK through five are doing engineering um, and, and design thinking. So this really wasn't, strongly in the curriculum before. Now we have a lab chock full of materials and we have a specialist that is working with the teachers to deliver this curriculum. So that just really feels like a, a value add in the STEM department. Um, so now strategic planning. Um, I just want to say this is a very big process and a big move, but it will guide us and everything we do going forward in the next three to five years is, is the window that they talk about. 
Um, it is, as Mariella said, this is a board responsibility, but it is something that the school does the heavy lifting on, but we do it, you know, um, for the board and the board ultimately signs off on everything. What you're going to see is very ambitious and we have followed uh, best practices and processes and we've involved anyone in the community that wanted to be involved in the process has been and we have these action planning teams that are working now um, in seven different areas developing these action plans that we will publish and present to you soon. Today I'm just going to give you a, a high level view of it. So, um, um, oh, and I also wanted to say that all of this work is in line with the previous work done by the school in, in previous versions of strategic planning. And we even pulled out, Alita and I, the, the original founding documents, and we found um, alignment um, with the same documents. So, we, so what we've done is maybe um, streamlined it, we've simplified it, but the vision is still alive. It's still very much the, the same school. And so to that end, what th this is approved. So I'm gonna tell you the things that are approved versus the things that have yet to be approved. We reviewed our core values and everything else flows from here. And we created these little um, icons to go with them too. So the little ones too can help you know, know what they mean. And, and we've been teaching all year, ask your kids about these things, ask them about empathy, ask them, they have been learning all, all this stuff and they, they are with puppets and it, it's just, it's already happening at school. So commitment to excellence, that's something that should ring true to you for those of you that have been with ISP for a while. We want to be compassionate and have integrity. That whole tagline you've heard for years, it's not about me, it's about us. But really, yeah, that's something you have to teach. Um, strength and diversity. We're really looking at how the, the, all of our differences, and we're all, we all have diversity, how that adds and makes a really rich environment at ISP. We're very innovative, and the, the, our innovative spirit. And then finally, having the concept of having a lasting impact, whether it's sustainable, sustainability, or anything else that we, we want to make a positive difference in this world. So that is approved. And you should, like when you came in, or when you come into school, you'll see signage and all kinds of things that will start showing these. This is also approved. Our mission before was a couple paragraphs. It was a bit longer. We were able to bring it into one sentence that we hope will resonate with the community in a way that everyone can remember it. So our mission is to inspire and challenge every learner, so that includes adults, that includes you, to reach their full potential and to become curious, independent, and compassionate citizens of the world. Oh, that is so powerful. That we, and, and everything that we do, we will tie to that. That drives our budget. That drives if we wanna add a new program to the school. Does it align to that? And if we can't say yes to it's aligning to that, then we don't do it. Um, next one. All right, so this is where we get approved and not approved. All right, so approved is this we have four objectives that we're bringing to life. And the first one is this idea of academic challenge. And what we're working on now is the plan to deliver on this. That's what has not been approved yet. So just to give you some ideas of the kinds of things that we're working on towards this goal to be approved is, number one, we want to align vertically and horizontally our curriculum. We find there's some places where it's, it's not quite aligned, so we're, that's one area. We wanna give our kids more interdisciplinary opportunities. I mean, in the real world of work, you don't stay in math or move over to science or talk about English. You know, it, everything's mixed together, so we wanna give them opportunities to do problem solving in a real world context in an interdisciplinary fashion. We want to ensure instructional design that considers all kinds of learners. You'll hear that a lot. We have quite um, neurodiversity in our school and we want to support everyone. We want to intelligently integrate technology. Um, data, that's another thing that is big in this. To, we want to use that to inform what we do and we want to use data to measure our success. 
And that, that was something even in our, um, our accreditation plan that they strongly encouraged. So that's, those are some of the ideas in the action plan around this idea of academic challenge. The second objective is about robust support systems. And so here we're talking about a number of things, such as um, ensuring that our, our lesson design, our classroom design, our assessment design, our, um, our materials, our curriculum materials, all of these things that consider all kinds of learners, their background, where they come from, their language level. Um, so we wanna push our brightest and we wanna bring along those that might have language that's holding them back, but hold them all to the same standards. And we can do that, we know how to do that, but that's an important system work. Another thing is training teachers in how to do multi-tiered support to support our diversity of learners. So that, that's a new concept here, and we already have teachers running with this as they're learning, and, and some of this work I'm seeing in classrooms is phenomenal. Um, we want to ensure we have aligned programs and systems, not only in academics, but in operations too. So we have lots of, of opportunities to connect dots that have been maybe working more in pockets, and we want to be a stronger system together. And finally, this involves a master facilities plan. So one of our action items is to look at our whole campus look at best practices like we were talking about in learning and, and let that inform the building design process. We want to um, you know, interview stakeholders and really plan well a f sort of a final campus plan that, that we can then move into um, stages and roll it out you know, based on what makes the most sense. So we're really excited to embark in that process. And that will, um, that, and that will also include looking at sustainability as one of our core values. All right, the third one is um, um, emphasis on character and wellness. This this was really important to the, especially to the parents and the students on our strategic planning committee. Um, number one, social and emotional learning. Like if, if the pandemic did anything for us, it showed us you know, how important connection was and, and how important it is t socially to, to be with people. So we have a whole plan around social and emotional learning. Leadership is another important thing. Every one of the kids at ISP, every one of them are going to be leaders somewhere, somehow. And so how are we developing their leadership skills? That is really important, and we can't just hope they figure it out along the way. So we're adding and developing is an action item, how we're gonna really embed that and develop that in our students. Um, wellness and health, we don't have a health curriculum. Um, wellness, again, from the pandemic, I think more than ever this is important, so we're really gonna look at that. Um, focusing on sustainable practices, um, and then we have a whole piece around diversity equity and inclusion and really taking our time to know what does that look like for ISP, doing a lot of stakeholder education, um, agreeing on where is a community we wanna go with this, but, but really it's, it's important that we appreciate the diversity that we have and come all together embracing it. Finally, our fourth and final objective that has been approved, but not the action plan, is this idea around professional learning and excellence. We are only good, as good as our worst teacher. You know, so what we need are the best teachers, the most excellent teachers at our school. And I gotta tell you, working in a number of schools, we do have excellent teachers here, but we, but we wanna you know, keep that going and we wanna make sure they're mission aligned and we wanna make sure that they buy into you know, all, all of these initiatives. And so what that requires is considering um, you know, recruiting and retaining excellent employees. So we have a whole strategy around that. Ensuring we have an evaluation system of teachers that supports teaching and learning excellence. Um, and that we have well-designed and coordinated professional development experiences, not just for teachers, but for all adults at the International School of Panama. We really believe that as much as the kids need to keep learning, we do too. So.
also the rollout, what you're gonna see in the coming months. Um, today is when we're sharing with you the work that we've done so far. Um, you'll see Dash, we've trademarked Dash, so now we have an official Dash that no one can take from us. Um, you'll see around campus banners showing our core values, huge signs with our mission statement. Every single classroom will have our definition of learning, our mission, our core values, and we're really all about living and breathing this in everything that we do. So in the coming months, we'll be presenting to the board next month our completed action plans from the seven teams that are working on these and when they approve it, um, Marielle and I will write a letter each to put in the front of a document that we will publish into the community. And this document will have all of our plans in great detail so you can see when we're doing what over the next few years and, and exactly what we're doing. So it's measurable, it's, they're smart, it's smart. And, um, and that way we can really see that we're making progress in the school. Um, so we've been busy and we've accomplished a lot and we're excited to move the school forward. And I would just say to you, um, stay tuned for next year's AG. You'll see, uh, I'm sure, a lot of, of exciting things. And so my last thing before I turn it over to Chris is, I wanna offer you a save the date to notice. We, next year, will be our 40th anniversary as a school. And on September 8th, 2022, we will have a gala celebrating this. I don't have all the details yet where it'll be, but I can tell you that all proceeds that we raise in this gala fundraiser will go to support our scholarship students. We just had two wonderful kids graduate from ISP from the San Miguelito region, and they both went to university. Um, they've got scholarships, they've got support. They are, they are coming back to make a difference in Panama, and it is a beautiful gift that the school gives back to the community. But it's not an inexpensive um, proposition because we want them to have the same experience as any other child. So not only is it tuition we have to pay for, but it's clothing, it's food, it's transportation. If they're on the soccer team, we're, not, we're gonna let them go to the soccer match in Honduras. You know? So it, it costs a lot to support these kids. And so we've just decided that this will be a great way to celebrate 40 years, but also um, help support the next scholarship kids that we'll bring in. So if you're around, we'll, more, we'll send you more information, but that, that's the, um, the date. And so with that said, I am very excited to turn this over to Chris Burghaust, who is the head of our governance committee. Thank you. Here you go, green button, perfect. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to say a warm welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate our colleagues online. Sorry that we were having some technical difficulties at the outset. So as mentioned, my name is Chris Burgost. I'm the chair of the governance committee. I've got four kids at ISP. I've been here for two years so far. Um, also on the governance committee are Yasser Williams, another board member, Vivian Holness, who's one of our parents, and also Dr. Menard, of course. I'll just quickly highlight three main accomplishments we did over the past year in governance. I know this might not be the most interesting or exciting topic, um, but it's an important one for the school and the longevity. First and foremost, we amended the bylaws. So thank you to everyone for voting in favor of the bylaws. These are changes that were, we'd been working on for actually several years, but we were able to get our 67% and we put the bylaws into effect. So that was a great accomplishment. Additionally, once we had the bylaws passed, we needed to then review our policy handbook and also our uh, board handbook, which were a big undertaking. Uh, we worked with an outside international consultant to be able to update a lot of the information that had been, frankly speaking, pretty dated and also too weedy for these documents. The idea is that the bylaws at the overall structure of the school, the policy manual talks about how we implement parts of the bylaws and the board handbook describes what the board's role is and how we should operate to implement the various other documents. So we had an opportunity of really going through from A to Z and making sure those were the best and most actionable possible. And finally, I wanted to highlight that we had a chance to revise the head of school and the board evaluation process. While obviously the prior boards had evaluated the head of school, it was a little bit of an ad hoc system and 
we wanted to make something aligned with international best practices. So we looked and found international standards, modified them towards ISP, and were able to implement that process in a very structured way. So we evaluated the head of school on a set schedule, um, linked it into her performance, and how we were evaluating her and have a mid-year assessment. And the board also assesses our performance of how we were doing, which is, again, an international best practice for other schools. So these are just some ways that we're trying to improve the overall systems that ISP has in place. Starting the audit committee is another example of something that's in our bylaws, which we hadn't done. So that's another example that we're trying to follow what we have said to be able to make things a better place for everyone. With that, thank you very much. I'm going to pass the mic over to my esteemed colleague, Eduardo, who's going to talk about their human resources side of the house. Good evening, all. Um, I'm Eduardo Caruso, Brazilian, in, uh, in my third year at the board. I'm representing the board as a secretary and also the head of the HR committee, and I'll walk you through the the achievements for the for this committee with my colleagues from the board, Gretel and Yasser, and from the Janet, and also the new recent uh, HR and talent and cultural manager that joined the ISP yesterday, right? So something, someone to join us in, and also bring new ideas to the school. In the past 12 months, you know, the, the past um, school year, we've been able to streamline HR operations process to, to become more efficient and, and strengthen our labor compliance. So as Dr. Menard said in the beginning, when we had budgetary restrictions, we need to look differently how we were going to structure the school, and uh, we came up with, a, she came up with great uh, results in terms of academic excellence and also operation um, uh, efficiencies. We look at payroll uh, and uh, streamline the processes. We reviewed, uh, we revised the uh, employee contracts as well. Uh, also, new faculty recruitment partners were, came to, to play, and we had the chance to reduce the costs in this, um, in this arena. And we also have a new HRIS system as one-stop shop for faculty and uh, staff. When uh, Dr. Menard said about professional development, evaluation performances, we can use this and, and leverage a better digital experience to everyone involved. Uh, more on the um, on the compensation benefits review, we've been looking at uh, opportunities to become closer and uh, to best market practices, and to also make sure that we uh, reward our uh, employees. That is the best asset that we have in the school, the most fair and uh, equitable way. So in this moment, we've been reviewing the staff tuition policy and we're looking at the insured benefits to make sure we can uh, leverage great uh, coverage, great uh, benefits um, to, to our uh, faculty and staff. Basically, it's been a busy year, as Dr. Menard said, and uh, these are the past uh, achievements from the committee and much more to come for the next year. So now I think I'll pass to our colleagues from the audience. So the show is yours. Good evening. I hope you and your family are doing well. Uh, I'm Aurora Diaz. I'm the partner in charge of the audit of International School of Panama. Today, I will do a summary of the audit process and our conclusions on the financial statement. First, you know, the areas of focus that we have uh, this year were cash. You know, uh, in that case, we uh, confirm or the balances, we review the bank confirmations you know, and, re and confirm also the time deposit and perform a cut-off procedures. For uh, accounts receivables, no, we also review the existence of those, review all the collections, rebates, 
and the information around that and review also the, the collection of those balances. For property plan and equipment, you know that is a very important item in the balance of the ISP. You know, we review the additions, we review all the computation of the depreciation and all uh, the additions and also review if there were any uh, in instance that we consider that could be any impairment of the assets. For loan uh, payables and the interest expense, no, we confirm with the bank the balances. We also review contracts and recalculated the amount of the uh, interest expense. For the payroll uh, related uh, no, uh, liabilities and expenses, we also review the, the computation of the reserve and we also review you know, on a test basis the additions to that provision and the payments. In the case of the revenue, you know, we review you know, the collections of the tuitions, the donations, and the different items to have on the revenue you know, in order to see that they were re recorded and presented in the financial statement the correct way. For the administrative expenses, we also you know the test on a day basis, the documentation that support and the authorization for those uh, payments and those expenses, and also review the correct presentation of the financial statements. Based on the work we perform, our audit, you know, we concluded that the financial statement of the International School of Panama present fairly in all material respects the financial position and the financial performance of the International School of Panama based on international financial uh, standard for a small and medium-sized uh, business. That is what we call an unqualified opinion. <clears throat> Here is a summary of the, the basic financial statement that we are going to be impressed, uh, the more detail presented by the chair of the finance committee, but here you see a the presentation of the assets, uh, liabilities, and the fund balances. And in the case of the income statement, no, you have the incomes that is, we classify in the different uh, items that they are like tuition and the fee, the capital or donations, student services, another income, administrative expenses, as also the interest income and the income expenses. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rafael Quinn. My son Bradley is in the second grade at ISP, and I am the board treasurer and head of the finance committee. Um, Here's a brief look at our agenda for this evening. If you have any finance-related questions during the presentation, you can enter the Zoom and enter them into the Q&A, which will be following the presentation. The Finance Committee meets monthly and is comprised of Mariela Paredes, the board chair, Carlos Giraldo, the board vice chair, Suzanne Purnell from P&G, director, Audrey Menard, director of finance and operations, Janet Nicolau, and the senior manager of finance and accounting, Nairobi Martinez. It's important to remember that our goal as a finance committee is to balance the current needs of the school while ensuring its financial stability for years to come. ISP is a nonprofit institution. We have no individual shareholder and any and all excess returns are reinvested in the school or saved for future use. Looking at our consolidated results for the 2021 school year, you can immediately appreciate a 20% drop in revenues versus the prior year. This was in part due to the $1.3 million in rebates given back to families during the pandemic. It was also due to less new students entering the school due to airport closures. Despite these challenges, we were able to eke out a small profit for the year of $199,000. We break down our results into two categories, operating and capital. Operational revenue comes from tuition, registration fees, institutional fees, and other income. Capital revenue comes solely from capital donations. Operational revenue is used to fund our day-to-day -day expenses, while capital revenue is used to maintain and improve our facilities, invest in technology, and implement major projects. 
For those families who have been at ISP for at least four years, they will remember that this breakdown used to look very different. There was a time the school ran a large operating deficit, which was subsidized by capital. We have worked hard over the last four years to correct this problem, and last year's results show the importance of those steps taken. Due to the pandemic, we received less new students than usual, which directly impacted our capital revenue. However, we were able to subsidize that shortfall with our operating result. This is a breakdown of our revenue distribution. As every year, the largest component of revenue was net tuition, followed by capital donation, institutional fees, registration, and other income. The largest component, oh, excuse me, the majority of our operating expense goes to academic personnel, which we continue to believe is the most important investment at the school. The quality of teachers at ISP are what make it such a special place. The 2021 school year was marked by a large amount of capital expenditure. Part of this was due to pending projects placed on hold the previous year due to the pandemic. Our insignia project for the year was the revamp cafeteria. We also invested in an ES STEM lab and iPad rollout. We closed the year with nearly 1.4 million in capital, which we have reserved for future projects. We also maintain over $5 million in our contingency and endowment accounts. I would like to give a special thanks to the U.S. Embassy for granting the school $270,000, which we used for a new CCTV system. This system is a core component of overall campus security. I would also like to touch on a capital project we executed a couple of years back, the PAC solar panels. This investment will pay back within five years. And more importantly, it has helped the school to save 204 tons of CO2, which equates to over 3,000 trees and strengthens our commitment to environmental protection. Looking ahead, we will be implementing a 1.5% tuition increase for next school year. With exception of the pandemic year, this will be our lowest increase in eight years. It comes out on average to less than $20 per month per student. Based on the success of our packed solar panels, we will be looking to invest in more solar panels campus-wide. We are also planning to continue investment in our facilities master plan as part of our overall strategic plan. As I previously mentioned, the cafeteria remodel was our major project of a very busy year. I would like to ask Patrick Kelly, who led our construction committee, to please come up and share more details about this important project. Thanks, Rafa. How many of you were able to do the tour of the cafeteria? What did you think? You liked it? Okay, excellent. Good. Well, it's a, it's a really important piece of infrastructure for the school. We have, set, uh, we have an average of 700 kids passing through there every day. And not only is it their place to eat, it's their place to meet. It's essentially the, the social focal point uh, for the school. And it was clearly in need of a major upgrade. And the decision was, to was taken not just to upgrade it, but basically to do an entire reconstruction. Um, and there were four or five key objectives in that. One was to increase capacity. One was to improve basically the delivery of the food. Uh, number three was to make it comfortable. And finally, to make it look good. And you know, hopefully you saw the, the, the final product and, and agree with that we were able to satisfy those objectives. After a series of rounds of um, negotiations with the Finance Committee, we landed on a budget of $1.7 million for the project. We had a timeline such that uh, our objective was to have it up and running for the start of the school year, and we were able to do uh, both of those things. We, we had a 10% contingency in the budget, which we didn't have to touch after some value engineering. And despite some pretty serious logistical challenges, particularly with respect to the kitchen equipment and the furniture, getting them to Panama, uh, we were able to bring the project online uh, on time. So uh, a very, very good result. The other thing that we're really proud about uh, as a board is that the process that we went through. It was, it was managed uh, in a very professional fashion. We went through a competitive licitation process. We went out with a request for proposal for the different pieces of the project. Uh, they were subject to evaluations to reference checks, to negotiations, uh, and it was conducted in a very thorough and professional manager, uh, uh, manner. We ended up uh, with a general contractor, uh, was Docabo, our equipment supplier was Coinsa, and the project manager uh, was Diaz and Diaz, who had experience with the school. 
And the fact of the matter, all the various pieces came together uh, extremely well. And in terms of who was involved, uh, we had an ad hoc construction committee uh, on the board of which I was chair. Chris was involved and Alexis uh, was involved as well. But pretty much all the heavy lifting on this project was done by Audrey's team, uh, particularly Jeanette uh, did a fantastic job, Jeanette Nicolau. Uh, she was supported by our head chef, uh, Halil Mendoza. We had people from security, we had people from infrastructure, uh, we had people from communications involved, and we also had input from the PTA, uh, parents and the kids themselves. So uh, a lot of people came together to make this project, project uh, a success. And the result is, is that we increased capacity by 30% uh, in terms of indoor dining. We added an outdoor area, which, which has another 80 seats, which has proved to be um, particularly popular. We expanded the menu. There's now, there's now a salad bar, or a juice bar, sushi, pasta, you name it. Uh, we serve it. So, um, you know, the, the, the menu offering that we have is, is both healthy and, and appetizing for the, for the 700 kids that pass through there every day. Uh, we've had great reviews from across the board, including uh, testimonies from the kids, the staff, the kitchen staff, uh, so everybody seems pretty happy. Uh, for those of you who are on campus and didn't do the tour, to the tour today, if you get a chance, look through it, and hopefully you'll be as proud of the, of the project as we are. So with that, Aaron, you want to put up the video? Thank you. background is amazing. It gives us a chance to like meet our friends, talk to them during lunch and during breaks. The food is amazing. They have options for like everything. For example, I'm gluten intolerant, but I can still eat a meal every day. And I really appreciate the chefs and the staff is super nice with everybody. Shall I just take this? I'm willing to do some dairy free. Good evening, and once again, thank you for joining us. Um, we will allow those in the audience to please um, come forward and ask your questions to the board if you have any. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, so I'll take that as uh, there are no questions in the audience and we will move forward with some questions on our Zoom uh, Q&A. The first question is about um, protocols for teachers who test positive. Um, what should be done in that case? I'll take that one. Um, and, and there's another question about just coming um, protocols for coming back in January. There's a couple of questions around that, so I think I'm gonna roll these kind of together. Um, so, you know, it, when a teacher tests positive for COVID, the first thing that we do is we get our team together and we start doing contact tracing. So the teacher is, is out because they've tested positive, so they're not in the building, um, but we do contact tracing to see if there's any 
everybody else we need to quarantine. And as you have heard, you know, there, there are nine classes that we have had to send home for a two week quarantine based on our contact tracing. Um, once we send them home, the teacher and or the students or other staff, they have to quarantine for two full weeks. And they are not, if you've been diagnosed, if you're quarantined for two weeks, you may come back. But if you were diagnosed, it's two weeks, plus you have to have a note basically from Mensa. And until you get the note from Mensa saying you may return to work, you stay at home. So that's what we do with our teachers. That's our, our protocol. Um, and frankly, it's the same thing with the kids. The, you know, they go home, we do the, t the contact tracing. So there really isn't different for, in, for um, teachers or students. And then as far as going forward and the concerns about fourth waves, fifth waves, you know, school, you know, Europe is a big hot mess right now. Um, we are just following our Swiss cheese model. It's worked for us. We've had zero confirmed cases transmitted on campus because we're, we're being really vigilant and we're going to continue to be. Um, we still take temperature. We don't have to do that. We still have masks. Um, we still... Um, ask parents with our pledge to keep your kids home if they have a fever. If we find they're showing any COVID symptoms, the nurse sends them home and asks to get them test, tested. So we're just being super vigilant and we haven't stopped and we're not going to stop. But as I said earlier in my presentation, we would appreciate your support in not getting too relaxed because just like I said, other countries around here have had to go back to shutting down. And if we continue to work together as a community, we hopefully can continue to protect each other and not have to um, close or go back to online learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. And like you had mentioned before, Audrey, I believe this does answer a couple of questions regarding COVID um, and vacationing. We have a second question um, regarding our IB scores. And the question is, does ISB score above, a world, above world average in every subject? I'll be happy to take that one too. And then we, ha we have a question from our audience next. <laughs> um, so while, when I saw that question popped up, I um, texted with my um, IB, coordinator slash high school principal. And so what I can say to you is that by far, um, the majority of our, first of all, the majority of our classes or our courses were above average. So 18 out of 32 subjects were above the world average. 100% received passing grades, which is the first time that's happened in seven years at ISP. So again, our, our scores are looking good, but you know, it's a, a world average is a world average. So all in all, we've very highly moved beyond that world average. Um, hi, yeah, I was wondering about the budget co uh, costs uh, that you saved. You said that um, in order to give out the rebate, you had to do some, um, you know, uh, adjustments. I was wondering if any key academic positions were cut and which of those were. Can you specify about the budget um, costs, cuts? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so, no, there were no permanent academic cuts taken in order to give the rebates. The rebates were given because by operating the campus with the campus closed, we did have savings. Um, it wasn't maybe as, as, as much as, 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 as we ended up giving back in the rebates, but we felt that it was also important for us to try to support as many ISP families as possible. Um, so those savings, not having as much professional development because there weren't people traveling into the country to give that type of professional development, not having any types of field trips, travel, um, not having electricity use on campus. These are just a few of the savings that we had and we decided to pass those on to the parents. Thank you for your question. Um, we have another question about technology. Big progress in technology to students. When thinking bigger, any ideas to have big technology center that allows students to be more active in the international IT environment? That's 
That is a wonderful question. And we have our um, director, wait, he's our coordinator of in, um, STEM and innovation. That, that's his title, Bill Hatcher. He desperately is lobbying me on a daily basis for a STEM building where we can do incredible work like that. So in the master planning, it'll when we look at our new facilities plan, that will certainly be part of the conversation, and we'll see where we go. As long as it aligns to our mission and our values, anything's possible. Thank you very much, Audrey, and I'd like to thank both the present audience and the audience at home. We have no more open questions. You, okay, okay please <laughs> join us. Ray, can you open the mic, please? Just a second. Yeah, uh, I um, think that uh, uh, there was kind of a, a higher uh, turnover of staff uh, uh, in the last two years than the years before. Uh, I, I'm a parent already since uh, 2016, uh, sixth year now. I had the impression that with the uh, the context of uh, the very difficult context, I must say, for everybody, also for the teacher, that there was a much higher turnover. Also, there were these governance problems. There were uh, we hear, heard now also some some reforms in uh, human resources management. Uh, uh, it, do you have like an evaluation how, how big this turnover was? Also the counselors uh, in high school, there was quite some turnover in the last two years. Uh, and, and how do you think that that might have impacted? I, I see and I'm very happy that the IB uh, scores were so high in the, in the class of uh, 2021. Uh, maybe also there, what, what, what do you foresee? Can we keep that level in in 2022? Uh, these are a few questions and, and it's all related of course with the pandemic and how it has impacted and, and an impact is there. I'm very happy for the 21 uh, uh, IB scores but uh, can you also say uh, uh, how do we uh, become a little bit more stable after all these turnovers and, 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 and what is your impression for the future? Thank you, and thank you very much for all your, your, your hard efforts, because it has been hard on all of us. Thanks. So I guess I'll take that one too. So we, we did have some, shall I say, casualties of the pandemic where people just, they lost family members, they had personal issues. There, there were casualties last year to the pandemic where they just needed, they couldn't, they didn't, the Panama was really locked down and they just needed to not, they needed to go back to the US. For the most part, it was it was US citizens. Um, but, it, but at the end of the day, the turnover rate wasn't really, it, there was a lot of talk about it being exceptionally high, but given the pandemic and given talking to other schools, I didn't find the, the turnover to be unusually high. As far as, you know, and I, I, like you mentioned some particular positions, you know, pe people have a right to their um, privacy, so I can't really share details about why particular um, people left. But um, I can say this year, our turnover rate is excellent. I mean, it's, it's very, we have a high retention rate. People are staying and, um, and I would say the work that we've done in HR has been very positive, and we, we've, there was a lot of there was a lot of things that needed to be worked on, and um, we're we're really happy to welcome. She's actually here tonight, um, Anna Maria de Leon. She will be our new um, coordinator of uh, or manager of of um, HR, and she is a talent and culture is what we're calling her, talent and culture manager, and she it brings so much experience from HR, not just in Panama, but also working internationally. So she's had both the expat experience as an HR person and the, the local experience. She's also been an ambassador from Panama to Italy, and she's has had quite an illustrious career as well, working um, as, as in the Ministry of, 
um, Foreign Affairs as, as the Director General, if that's the right term, for, for running the office, basically. And so we are so lucky to have her here, and we've shared with her you know, all the things in, in the HR realm that we need to work on to really bolster, again, these important strategic planning goals. And we feel like we've got just a heck of a great partner. And of course, Eduardo and Gretel on the, the HR committee, they're both very experienced in the world of HR as well. So we've got a good team working on all of this. So I feel like the future is really bright. You asked a lot of questions, so I don't know if I got them all. And what does he want about IB going forward? Great job this year. How do you see it going forward? Oh, um, going forward, I expect similar great results. I mean, this year our kids will take the IB exam, where last year they did not because we weren't able to, we couldn't have everybody on campus or require everyone to be on campus. It was optional. So this year everybody will be taking, sitting for the exam, so that will be different. But um, I don't know, I, I feel like the, the IB is just as strong as ever. We didn't have much turnover in the IB realm, and the teachers that we have are excellent. So um, our kids are motivated. I'm not, I, if, honestly, last year, I was more worried about the kids last year because they were just saying um, it was too much. They, were, they really were struggling. Where this year, they're really not complaining at all. They're just buckling down and working hard. So I, I feel good. But the proof is of the pudding, right? We'll see what those scores show us. All right, since we have a couple more minutes, um, we will answer another question regarding uh, what would be the protocol for back to school um, after the end of year vacation or break? What's the protocol to come back to school after Christmas break, after the holidays? So the protocol to come back, it's it's you, you need to follow the government policies, um, and so the, it, they change. But currently, if I am if I am up to date, but I would recommend you check with the Panamanian government. If you travel and you are not vaccinated, then you need to come back and get vaccinated and and test negative before you can return to school. And I think it's it's a minimum of five days that you have to stay out. But check the government um, website for that. If you travel and you're vaccinated, then you can come back to Panama and then you don't have to quarantine to come back is my understanding. But again, I'm, I, it changes. So that's why I refer you to the, their website. So if you're traveling, that, that, I would assume you're in one of those two categories. Thank you very much. And is there anyone else in the audience who would like to ask a question? All right, then with that, we will um, finish our Q&A session. Thank you very much. <laughs>